Well, it's a pleasure to be here. <laughs> Thank you all for coming. Um, and um, I thought about um, commenting on all the comments that had been made about my work this morning. And I thought, no, that's a bad idea. Um, I thought it would be better to um, say a little bit about the um, nominal reason for our original having this event, which was the 40th anniversary of you know, publication of quality. We're now at the 41st anniversary of quality, but that's okay. So what I thought I would do um, was to um, say a little bit um, about what I thought in retrospect with the uh, strengths and weaknesses of that book. Um, but before I do that, I wanted to just flag one thing, which I'm not going to do, but which I will do later today after we're finished with my glass of wine and my hands, which is to say a little bit about the collaborators who I had on that book, because um, despite its title, um, there's a strong tendency of people to um, assume that um, the book was only written by me. And in a literal sense, that's true. I wrote sentences. But it would never happen without all the other people who talked about work without their work and their various roles. But I'm going to put that off. Um, but before more, I can be sentimental too. So now I'm going to say a word about inequality. Um, the customs of my family um, forbid me from saying anything positive about my own work. <laughs> <laughs> and so um, I'm going to talk about what I now see as the book's main flaws and limitations. <laughs> Those of you who have been my students may see a pattern. <laughs> and um, I would say that with the wisdom of hindsight, such as it is, uh, my biggest regret about that book is that it didn't draw a very clear distinction between two fundamentally different questions. The first is the question of who ends up on different rungs of the American economic model. And the second question is what determines the distance between the rungs of that line. Um, the first question is a question about um, with many, many co-authors called who gets ahead of them. You could also think it as a question about equality of opportunity, although it's not exactly that, but it's, it is a question of who goes where. The second question about why the distances between the rungs of the economic economy change over time, and why they vary from country to country, is a completely different question. Not quite completely different, as you can see, but more different than I realized when we were working on this book, or more different than the book thinks. Inequality is really mostly well, about the first question. It's about the relative importance of your genes, your parents, your test scores, your <coughs> educational attainment, and your occupation, about where you sit on the economic ladder. And um, that's what I would call a micro question. I'd call it a micro question because you can address it with individual life level data, at least if it's longitudinal data, if you have a representative sample of some country you can. You can give answers to who ends up where by just tracking people over time and seeing where they end up. Um, now, when we were writing inequality, um, we didn't have such a data set, um, nor did anybody else. Um, and um, so we combined data from a bunch of different sources, glued those data sets together, told ourselves it was close enough to give you a good approximation and you always say when you have no alternative. Um, and um, then we um, cranked out some results. Um, I would say given the limitations of our approach, our estimates were better than I had, would have expected. Or they held up better than I would have expected. I had a sinking feeling when we were doing this that they might hold up for two years. Um, and then somebody would come along and say, you know, here's some much better data. These numbers. Um, the main difference between what we did and what people would do now, I would say, is that we tried to predict the determinants of people's income 
in a single year. And that was because that's the information we had. Um, we did have a little information about how stable incomes were from one year to the next, and we did do some of our estimates incorporating that information and trying to adjust the models to do something that was a little closer to um, three years of income than to one year of income, or maybe even to five years of income. And that was because we thought um, there was pretty compelling evidence that at least some of the time, People smooth their consumption over three years, maybe even five years, and that you want to get some sense of well, where people stand in the consumption ladder rather than just a flow of income ladder. Um, but um, I don't feel at all badly about the fact that we did um, have data on uh, lifetime income. Because I think if we had, we might have tried to use that as our outcome measure. But I think that probably wouldn't have been a good idea for what we were trying to do. Um, and um, let me explain why that's the case. Because nowadays, um, everybody would say that's, that was the wrong choice. And maybe it wasn't. But basically, it seemed to me, um, if, you, if you treat lifetime income as the measure of people's economic success, um, you lose the, um, the fluctuations of their lives, and that the character of those fluctuations is really important. And the story about success and failure that doesn't take into account the fact that people are moving up and down is a problem. Now, if it's only a fact problem that they're moving up and down in the sense that their paycheck comes once a month and that they tend to run out of money at the end of the month, I don't they have to worry too much about that. But I don't have to worry too much about that. But if it's a story about, well, you know, some people do really well when they're young and then they get all the skids, drink a lot, and um, they're really poor for the rest of their lives, um, I sort of don't feel like lifetime income is really the right way to understand what's happening to them. But it is true that if you use the kinds of models that we use, um, you don't explain as much of the variation as you would if you used the kinds of models that predict the lifetime income, because you throw away a lot of the variation that we're very bad at explaining, namely what happens to people's lives when it's going like that. Um, but um, it's not the case that people smooth their incomes over their lifetime. They don't even smooth their incomes very well over their lifetimes, unless they're quite affluent. When the most predictable of all possible things happens, namely they get older. And unless you browbeat them into um, saving money and um, doing all kinds of things that they don't do spontaneously, um, they end up with very little money when they get old. Um, now, pension plans, we have social security, we've devised a whole series of schemes to encourage people to, to do that. But left to their own devices, people are not very good at this. And of course, it's even less true when you don't have as predictable a world as the world in which you get old. Um, so we did do one thing with those data which spoke to the question of um, inequality of condition as opposed to who ends up where. The one thing we did was the following. We said, um, how much could you reduce inequality if people who were um, similar on the characteristics that social scientists at least and the political system tended to think maybe we could manipulate it make a difference. Suppose people were alike on all those characteristics. How much variation would you still see? The mental experiment here, which um, I only realized many years later, should have been the first page of the book or something, was just to show the distribution of income for people who were all high school graduates and show the distribution of income for the United States. And when you look at that, you see, well, it's a little bit, but um, 
they both look very dispersed. And that's the idea. But we did it in a more um, extreme way. We said, um, how, if you predict the wages of people who um, have similar family backgrounds, who have the same test scores, who have the same amount of schooling, who have the same occupations, and have the, actually the same um, genes for test scores, that's in, in itself a rather hypothetical thing because it's not that there is such a thing as genes for test scores. It's clear that genes affect test scores in some way, but what genes they are and how they do it is <coughs> wrong of mystery. We calculated, well, if you do that for white males of working age, how does the variation among those people compare to the variation in the overall population of white working age males? And it was about 12 to 15 percent less. So the dispersion was compressed by about 12 to 15 percent. It's not 12 to 15 percent of variance, which is different. But you just you measure the standard deviation across these things. It's about, it's reduced by something between 12 and 15 percent. So that's the estimated of effect. If you made people homogeneous, completely homogeneous on all those things, well, of course, that's a completely unfeasible and probably undesirable policy. <coughs> you don't really imagine that we're going to make everybody be brought up in identical families, have identical test scores, stay in school the same number of years and work in similar occupations. We might imagine that we compress these things, bring up the bottom on test scores, bring up the bottom on years of school completed, and make better parents and so forth, but literally the same. It's not hard, so of course, the effect of homogeneity will go down as you allow more homogeneity to creep into your system. And um, instead of compressing the distribution by 12 to 15 percent, you might compress it by four, five, seven, something like that. So that led, I was about to say us, but actually that led me to conclude that making people more alike was not a very good strategy for reducing economic inequality. And in the book's conclusion, we argued for a different strategy, which was aimed directly at compressing incomes and not at compressing the determinants of income. It's a variation of the paragraph that Chris put up this morning. Um, we didn't really explain why the two approaches were fundamentally different. Um, we didn't really um, do that because we were focused on the United States. And let me come back to this in a second. Reducing the distance between the rungs of the economic ladder is really a macro problem, not a micro problem. You can't understand what's going on if you just think of the level of inequality as something that is built up from individuals. You have to think about it that the distribution of income as a property of a social system, a society. Now, of course, it depends on what kind of individuals are in the society. Um, I can talk, you know, if you have a population of ants, it will look different than if you have a population of people. Um, it's not that you know, the participants are irrelevant, but it is the case that it is still a property of the group. Um, and changing those distances means that you have to change the social determinants societal determinants of those distances. And that includes stuff like changing the machinery of political decision making or culture that influences voters' preferences or whether the society can collect its taxes or enforce its laws and whether people with a lot of money can influence voters' preferences and um, when the voters are recalcitrant, whether they can get elected officials to do what they want even though the voters don't want them to. Um, all of that kind of stuff affects the overall distribution of income, but it is not um, easily thought about as just being properties of individuals, properties of a social system. Um, now, I don't want to say that um, everything Larry Katz told you this morning 
is wrong because it's not. <laughs> we wrote a brilliant book on this subject, and I am completely convinced by it. And um, it is true that supply and demand matters. Um, it's also true that institutions matter, as he said in his presentation. And I noticed he skirted the question of, well, which one is more important and which one is less important? And of course, the answer to that question would depend on, well, which ones vary the most? Which ones the, most? the relative importance of things depends on their variability. Um, so, um, but it's certainly true. Policies that produce surpluses of skilled workers, which we are all in theory in favor of, but personally will lose from. Um, if you have a surplus of skilled workers relative to unskilled workers, that's bad for the skilled workers and good for the unskilled workers, and it compresses the distribution of income. How much? That's not so clear. Um, and conversely, if you have a policy that produces a surplus of unskilled workers and a shortage of skilled workers, um, then distribution spreads out. So this is not a, I'm not saying there's nothing going on here. I'm only saying it's not the whole story. So let me now turn to a simple-minded comparison. Um, I want to compare the United States and Sweden. And I want you to imagine that we're um, going to measure income inequality. And we're going to do that by drawing the names of people out. And um, we're going to draw them out in pairs, reach into the pack. send it to the IRS and we get a um, back the absolute difference in dollars between that pair of those two people. And we do that over and over and over again until the leaf is experienced or until the statisticians tell us that we've got the standard error down to a very small. Um, and because it's the IRS, it can be a very small. Um, and then we do the same thing in Sweden where they, um, it's much easier to do that. Um, and, um, <laughs> We compare, now we have the absolute difference between these random pairs, both in Sweden and the United States. But they're, one's measured in kroner and one's measured in dollars. We're going to do something to get them on this constant scale. So we divide by the mean income of all households in each case. And we get a number which um, is a kissing cousin to the Gini coalition. Um, and in 1975, a few years after inequality, that number was about 1.5 times bigger in the United States than it was in Sweden. This is after having subtracted the taxes adjusted for household size. Thirty years later, inequality was higher in both Sweden and in the United States. And that number was 1.6 times higher in, Sweden, in the United States than in Sweden. So it wasn't a big change in the ratio, but um, it was still a big difference. Um, so now, the question I want to ask, this is an absolutely crucial question, which I don't know the answer, so I'm going to, I'm going to speculate. Um, what harm did the Swedes suffer as a result of their egalitarian choices? What was so bad about the Swedish regime compared to the American regime? The main thing that I would say from my point of view is bad about it is that they spoke Swedish. <laughs> um, from their point of view, it wasn't as much of a handicap as it was from my point of view. Um, and, um, but, you know, it does result in a certain kind of, some degree of cultural isolation and so forth. And that, they, they like to travel and they learned English so that they could participate vicariously in sinful American culture. Um, but let's think about it more concretely, or at least in a more classical economic way. Let's say um, the compression of incomes in Sweden meant that the difference in wages for um, doctors and uh, plumbers, let's say, um, was less than it was here. And it also meant that the returns to becoming a doctor, going to medical school, or going the wages you could have been making as a plumber and so forth, were somewhat lower. And in a classical model, we would say, OK, well, that should lead to a shortage of doctors in Sweden. We should have more doctors in the United States than we have in Sweden because the returns are higher. Now, um, it turns out that Sweden has plenty of doctors. Um, it turns out, indeed, that Sweden has more doctors per capita than the United States. 
Um, it's not totally clear to me, although it may be clear to people who study this matter, why that is. But I can think of two easy stories. One is there are a lot of non-monetary benefits of being a doctor, um, and probably even more in Sweden than here because they're still rather deferential towards doctors. And they, call them, they don't sue them as much. All kinds of things that might have been the doctor more fun in Sweden. Um, and might induce a Swedish doctor to say, stay in Sweden, which in a sense is maybe the big question of why they don't lose their doctors. Um, it's also possible that it's harder to get to be a doctor in the United States than it is in Sweden. Um, and you could say, well then, as a result, Swedish medical care wouldn't be as good as medical care in the United States. There is some evidence for that in a couple of studies, but the fact is that it's people in Sweden live quite a bit longer than people in the United States, so it's hard to really work yourself up and swim it about what a terrible deal it is to be a Swede, because <laughs> you're not getting proper medical care because of this egalitarian wage distribution. Um, so um, I don't want to argue either that the reason that the Swedes live longer is because their distribution of income is more equal than ours. Um, because um, if you look at Denmark and Finland, which have almost the same distribution, they're um, among the people who are countries which have the worst distributions in the rich world. They're not quite as bad as the United States, but they're way below lots of other European countries. Norway and Sweden do better, and I don't know why, and I ask Scandinavian residents this all the time, and they mutter things about alcohol. <laughs> but I believe this is all a product being brought up as Lutherans rather than <laughs> um, <laughs> Anyway, um, I had a few glimmers of all this in 1972 when I was writing the conclusion on inequality, but I didn't really it didn't sink into me that this was a completely different subject which I needed to master in its own right rather than being some kind of logical extension of the work we've done looking at the determinants of individual success. That didn't really happen until the Luxembourg income study appeared in the 1980s. And it became possible to look at a table and see what the distribution of income looked like in various rich democracies and see numbers that you thought you could perhaps believe, um, which was, there were lots of numbers out there before then. Um, numbers that told you things like, the distribution of income is as equal in India as it is in the United States. Uh, oh, um, anyway, you didn't kind of think that was the way to go. Um, but after this, I felt much better about it. And not only that, but much more important, a lot of other felt much better about it too, and a vast body of comparative work looking at the causes and the consequences of this, these differences across countries sprang up. And we, I think we learned quite a lot of things. I'm going to say some things about um, my conclusions from that work, which are not all supported by the literature, but they are my conclusions. Um, and um, the first is, that in the absence of constant oversight and regulation, market participants, if you have a free market, will always find a way to conclude, to collude, sorry, not conclude. They're far from wanting to conclude. They want to keep it going as long as possible. Um, but um, they do collude, and what they collude to do is to raise their incomes above the level that a competitive market would yield. And in fact, if you think about what you're taught to do in business school, that's pretty much what you're taught to do. If a market is really competitive, you don't really do very well. And if you can figure out a way to keep it from being competitive, you're in much better shape. Um, well, if you're the only players in town, you win. Um, it's only if somebody's making you um, follow some set of rules that there's a chance of becoming closer to competitive equilibrium. Um, In recent years, I think we've taken a step beyond that, which <coughs> helps account for the United States and Britain, anyway, which is this development of the financial sector and particularly kind of casino capitalism, <coughs> in which people who are well-informed bet against people who are worse informed. 
and make staggering sums of money by being right. Sometimes they're also wrong. I mean, plenty of people have lost their shirts in this thing who thought they were very clever. So I'm not, I don't mean to say it's completely risk-free. It's definitely a business and industry, a high, higher level form of gambling. Um, and um, one of the things that is never discussed in it, as far as I can tell, is that if you are in this industry and you make a lot of money, somebody else has to have lost a lot. And it's not at all clear to me that the net result of all this has any effect on the real economy that I can discover, but except to destabilize it. That's, that's a problem. Um, the, um, so my second conclusion is that creating a strong state capable of regulating the economy is a necessary condition for limiting inequality, but it's not sufficient. Both the United States and Britain have a state strong enough in principle to regulate the economy. We've done that in the past. Um, we could do it again. Well, we could in principle do it whether it's politically feasible. Um, but the distributional consequences of a strong democratic state really depend on whether it's well, dominated by political parties that are beholden to the rich or the not so rich. And um, in the United States, we have one party beholden to the rich and another party beholden to the rich and the not so rich. And that's some kind of fun. I'm not sure whether that's a stable equilibrium or not. <laughs> My third conclusion about this is that the struggle between the uh, rich and the not so rich for influence over the government in a democratic society depends on the degree of solidarity among the not so rich. I think this is consistent with what was said this morning. Um, but um, <clears throat> it's being said in a slightly different way. Um, the, um, the absence of solidarity among the not so rich, I think, explains why the United States is more unequal than Sweden. It's probably also the reason why most of the egalitarian rich democracies, Scandinavia, the low countries, are very small. Because producing solidarity among the not so rich in a country with 300 million people is pretty tough going. Um, it's even tough going in a place like Sweden, and um, you know they've got eight million, I think, about the size of Massachusetts. Or like that. Um, so um, I don't know that there's much prospect for this unless you organize in some way. I and mean, that was the thing that the labor movement tried to do and did somewhat successfully for two or three decades. Um, that's out of a history of better than 200 years, so I don't know whether we should look back and say those were the golden years or whether we should just say, oh well. Um, but um, I also want to emphasize being small, although it may be a necessary condition for having solidarity among the not so <coughs> is not a sufficient condition either. Um, Ireland, Israel, these are small countries and they're quite unequal. Israel is right up there close to the United States. Um, Switzerland, also a little more than Ireland and Israel, but not, not especially. Um, so I want to close with a speculative argument about why inequality has risen in the United States. And I think it's the simplest way to put it is inequality beats on itself. The rising share of income and wealth controlled by the richest families increases their political influence. That's obvious. But more important, I think, it is, is that rising economic inequality redirects our, I was going to say our, and then I crossed it down and wrote men's um, competitive impulses into uh, getting rich instead of winning the Nobel Prize or writing the great American novel or doing good, <laughs> or cleaning up the mess in Washington, that's the famous movie that I remember from my childhood. I don't think this happens to the same degree among women, but I'm 
But when I was an undergraduate at Harvard just a few years ago, um, my classmates hardly ever wanted to go into business. It was so fun. It was so boring. Um, it was so, they wanted to go to medical school, graduate school of arts and sciences, to law school. Less boring. The prospect was less boring than um, business. That wasn't because they, we were high-minded. It was because we didn't see anyone getting really, really rich. People weren't getting really, really rich. The few people who were really, really rich in that era had had parents who were really, really rich. <laughs> and um, the CEOs of big companies made a lot of money by our standards, but it wasn't. Um, and getting to be the CEO of a big corporation seemed dull, dull. <laughs> but I thought I was a long slog to nowhere. Um, Fifty years later, that's all changed. Um, young adults are taking companies public at huge prices. Wall Street's turned into a money machine. Employees. The message here, I think, is that emulation is a driving force in human behavior, and the things people choose to emulate can change fairly quickly. And rising income inequality is one of the things that I think seems to change it. Um, so greed begets more greed, selfishness begets more selfishness, courage begets more courage, um, and um, Curiosity, but gets more curiosity. That's a lesson that I think social scientists and especially maybe economists need to incorporate into the Thank you. Thank you. So I'm French, and so in France we still work for the government. We don't go and work in finance, it's not, it's not that core. Cool. If you do, you go to London, so you need to give up your country, you know, there's, there's some value to that. And so, and we have a really low growth rate. We're not, entrepreneurial spirit doesn't exist. And if the new source of growth are from these entrepreneurs that are leveraging, you know, opportunities for productivity. While I agree with you, Sandy, I, there must be a trade-off there. What's your opinion on this idea that we do want business to be rewarded, and that maybe the problem is that in France, business and entrepreneurship has not been rewarded as much as in the US. Oh, I have two thoughts about this. Um, the first is, the, the model that in some way seems most attractive to me is to uh, say, we do need entrepreneurship, and if you're in uh, France or any other country, you would like that entrepreneurship to occur somewhere. You need new product, you want innovation, you want better computer software, whatever. Um, but why should you want it to happen in your country? Um, you have one of the big advantages of living in the modern world is that if the Americans invent something, you can have it. You can even make it. Um, and if you make it cheaper than they can make it in the United States, they'll make it in your country instead. Mm -hmm. Um, so you're not excluded inherently from most of the benefits of entrepreneurship. And if you look at the growth rates of the European countries, which have not been known as much innovation as the United States, partly because they're a lot smaller and so you know, bigger store of streppers people who don't want to fall in line and get a job in the corporation and invent something. Um, but why not be parasitic off the United States? Now, that's a, that's a half an answer. The other half of my answer is, um, I think um, that the choice that is, you see in the data seems to be <coughs> that in the United States, GDP per um, capita is higher than in most, almost all the countries in Europe. GDP per worker is um, somewhat higher, but not quite as much higher. 
GDP per hour worked is actually lower than I'm in love for European countries. And we've, we've made a choice that we would rather have more money and work more hours, and Europe has made a choice that it would rather work uh, more hours, work uh, fewer of them. Um, and that's a choice countries can make. Um, I, myself, having reached the age I've reached, which I will not discuss, um, <laughs> I just think, um, you know, maybe hours of work can be overdone as a virtue. <laughs> <laughs> but um, it's a, the main thing that I think is, well, you know, you um, this is something that should be settled by a somewhat democratic process. And the thing that worries me most about the possibilities of inequality in the future is that um, the political power of the rich could reach a point, or may have reached a point, that um, it's very difficult politically to reverse that decision. And that you, you can get yourself on a, on a track where you can't decide, oh, gee, this looks like not the world we want it after all. Um, but I think there is a choice to be made about what kind of a world you want. Yeah. Yeah, I, I'm just surprised that you made, uh, for someone so careful about this sort of thing, that you made a longitudinal argument out of a cross-sectional comparison just then. The period of time following your undergraduate period was the most sustained, prosperous period of growth in the United States. Mm -hmm. It did not involve lots of entrepreneurs. It involved innovative organizations that in large part based their innovations on basic science that was funded by the US government and came out of their research labs. And somehow to say now what we need is a lot of entrepreneurship is a misreading of that last 40 years, 40 or 50 years. It's a longitudinal question. You shouldn't say that the US compared to France now um, in France is not growing as fast as you need entrepreneurs. The question is, did the United States grow as fast during the period when people like you didn't want to go into business so much compared to now? The people who want to go into business now and make a lot of money are not generating a lot of growth in the United States. I think um, Steve, Steve Jobs is not the answer to innovation in the United States. I mean, I'm taking this slightly away from inequality, but the sources of innovation are not in the entrepreneurs, they're in the basic science that was funded by uh, the government basically uh, at the behest of the Defense Department. Well, I think there are a lot of sources of innovation, and I don't disagree with you about the Defense Department or about the importance of science. But I do think there's also, um, for better and for worse, there's a vast amount of commercial innovation as well. I mean, there are new kinds of ice cream out there as well as new kinds of computers. And um, for many people in the United States, the new kinds of ice cream are probably more important than the new kinds of computers. Which generate more jobs? Um, probably very few jobs generated by new kinds of ice cream, but a great deal more consumer satisfaction. <laughs> <laughs> Sandy, I have a quick question. May I? Is that the same maroon t um, <laughs> turtleneck that you wore in 1972? In 1972, when you first presented to the School of Education in Longfellow Hall, the results of inequality. I hope not. <laughs> I can report from careful experimental studies that the half-life of a maroon t-shirt <laughs> turtleneck is about four years, and that by the time they're eight years old, you have to throw them away. <laughs> I think it's unlikely to be the same one, although it's probably made by the same firm. Maybe. One more question. Sandy, I'm I got the I'm person with the mic. I'm afraid, but I just got back from Sweden. I'd say the yeah, growth of inequality over the last five or ten years in Sweden may be among the highest in Europe, um, and I'm sure it hasn't shown up in any data yet, but it, it, it's shocking actually if there's someone who's made many, many visits to that country. The, uh, the fact that the Swedes have almost kept up with us so that the ratio hasn't changed suggests that you're right. 
to if you do those measures, both for the top 1% and for the Gini coefficient, the, the growth is not quite as fast as the United States. So, uh, how about now? famously said that we had the best Congress money you can buy, <laughs> but nothing has changed much. I mean, when Daniel Webster, the famous letter from Daniel Webster to the railroad saying that if the railroad wanted them to continue to represent their interests in Congress, they had to uh, remember to send them this monthly paycheck. It's just that there's uh, so much money now floating around the system. Of course, we'd be better off if we could copy the United Kingdom and limit uh, campaigns to three weeks. Uh, but uh, constitutionally, that's hard to do, and of course, it's very hard to change the constitution. But that would that would make an enormous difference. Of course, politics was famously once described as the art of getting money from the rich and votes from the poor, while mm. tending to protect each from the other. And that, that's uh, still very much the case. But that raises the critical question of why the poor and the middle class don't unite. What uh, what divides them? And I think in this country, we know what divides them. Uh, one of the things that surprised me about the discussion so far is that the word race has hardly come into it, yet of course it's easily observable that the countries which are prepared to be taxed at a much higher rate to help out their fellow citizens tend to be racially homogeneous, the Scandinavian countries for one thing. And here the situation is just the opposite, and the, uh, the less well-off have been divided on long the very ar various arguments that uh, Republican strategists like Carl Rove have developed, they've been divided on social issues. Um, so that a lot of the poor and, and middle class, when they hear about uh, increasing taxation to do various things, they simply say to themselves, they're going to, ah, they're going to tax me to pay for them. And this seems to me a, you know, a, a fundamental problem in this country. Indeed, a lot of what the discussion about Obamacare uh, occurs because it's called Obamacare. It started from the facts that the Affordable Care Act was conceived by the Heritage Foundation as an alternative to a national health system. You know, you'd be in a different place, but there's simply, and you, one can look at where the Tea Party is strong. It's, you know, in the Old South and certain other places where um, they hate it because of Obamacare. They can't accept the president who is half African American and grew up in, partly in Indo. Uh, uh, Indonesia and so on. It doesn't seem one of them, and one can't get away, I think, from these hard truths of these sociological factors. And I think, in, unless there's some way really of getting at that, we're stuck in the horrible uh, current impasse. The other two points I'd like to make briefly is uh, we tend to, uh, of course, I'm an historian now by profession, but we tend sometimes to overlook the devastating results of of chance bad decisions. I mean, the, uh, we had a period of uh, tremendous growth, both in income and equality, which is after World War II, we were the only country left standing. And the effects of the war in Iraq on our current situation are just, you know, that choice is absolutely devastating. I mean, before that, Alan Greenspan was worrying about the fact we were going to pay off the entire national debt and how would he manage the economy if there were no outstanding uh, treasury bonds. I mean, uh, you know, we forget how quickly things can change. Mm -hmm. And finally, I think it's worth observing that not all dollars are created equal. Uh, we, you know, we have all these measurements, but a lot depends on what you're spending the dollars on. I, I saw one day, I, I think this is correct, the astonishing statistic that one out of every seven people employed in this country are employed in keeping the lid on. That is to say, they're either in the armed forces uh, or they're in the police or they're prison guards or they're uh, uh, involved in uh, 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 watching over people on parole uh, or uh, they're private security guards, which is the fastest growing occupation in the country. Well, why not school teachers? Hmm? <laughs> <laughs> School teachers in some areas, certainly. Um, well, if one out of every seven people are employed in keeping the lid on, whereas they could be employed in 
repairing all the broken roads and ridges and uh, 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 doing all the other things that desperately need doing, uh, training the poor. Uh, you know, the, the, this is something that the, the gross national accounts don't pick up and uh, pack the picture, picture enormously. I've spoken too much, I'll stop it. <laughs> I just wanted to throw one other thing in the hopper about this. I think you're right about rents. Um, but I think um, it's striking to me that there are several countries which are deeply divided ethnically, Canada and Belgium, for example, which have managed to have fairly egalitarian policies in a wide range of areas. Now, Canada is not overall an egalitarian country, but it's a very strong safety kind of And Belgium has been spending money to keep the country from falling apart. Um, this seems to be a motive that the um, English speaking people in Canada are willing at least to put up with Canada as well. Um, but in either case, it's racism. It's, it's a language that, that didn't get mixed up with skin colors. If it had been me, I would have been much more concerned about my language. Than So, uh, Sandy, you, you distinguish now uh, between the um, who's on the rungs and the uh, height of the ladder. And of course, there's, there's a third question, which is how low is the lowest rung? Uh, these are empirical questions, but they also are normative questions. And you've, you've begun to talk about why this matters. And these three things might matter for different reasons. We care about where you are on the rung because of simple fairness. But if all we did is reshuffle, for every upperly mobile child, it needs to be a downwardly mobile child, and we, we, there's something that we haven't improved. Right? Uh, compression, of course, matters. It especially matters if we think that being widespread has a secondary effect on the distribution of political equality. But if somehow all you could do with, with your money is buy yachts, but you couldn't buy politicians, we probably would care less about that. Here's a little you know, a, a, a mind experiment. If in order to increase the bottom 10%, by 100%, you had to increase the top 10% by 101%. I'm not sure we would care if we set aside uh, the, the political effects of, of how wide the rung are, uh, uh, how high the ladder is. Um, so that leaves us with how high the bottom, the, how low is the bottom, and arguably that's the most important thing. I don't think it's important policy-wise because I think policy-wise we're so out of whack on all three of these measures that it's clear what direction we want to go in. But as a as a matter of political rhetoric and political strategy, these are three very different arguments. And can, can you enlighten us about which do you, both which argument really which do you care most about? Do you care about uh, the sorting? Do you care about the dispersion? Or do you actually care about the fate of the people on the bottom rung? Uh, and which which political strategy or rhetorical strategy do you think is the best one to employ in order to achieve? What do you think is morally most important? Well, I do mostly care about the people on the bottom row. Yes. So that's the first thing to say, or the bottom few rows. Yes, yes. Um, the, um, the way I think about this is that um, if the pie grows faster than inequality grows, then getting a smaller share of the pie may leave you with more pie. Um, if the pie grows slower than inequality grows, as it has since 2000, then getting a smaller share leaves you with a smaller share of the pie. Um, exactly the same. There's a, there's a little space in there. But certainly from 1967 to 1999, I'd say, um, the best estimates we have of the income levels of the bottom 10% or 20% suggest that incomes, absolute incomes, purchasing power is going up. Since 1999, no. Um, during most of that period, the share of income going to the bottom was falling, but their incomes were going up. So you could say, well, inequality was rising in a sense. Well, then the question is, which do they care about? Um, and I would say, this is a great idea. And of course, the answer would be, well, people care about both. Um, well, then I would like to know um, 
how much do they carry and in what ways and with what consequences. And as far as I can see, there's almost no work on this. Class. Um, we had lots of studies that show that people care about relative income and about that it's stressful to be at the bottom. And, blah, 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 blah. and we have lots of other stuff that shows that not having enough is bad. But almost nothing that says, well, OK, if I can make your real standard of living rise by 2% a year, but your position relative to the people of the next um, quarter of the income distribution won't rise, but they fall slightly because they're rising by 3% a year, um, are you better off or worse off? Or would you be happier or more miserable? Or would you get ulcers more often or whatever? I don't know much work on that. I just know of a lot of intense rhetoric on the subject. And the intense rhetoric is produced by people who show that both things matter, which I totally agree with. But this is a horse race in some sense, potentially. It may not really be, but it, you can think, well, as it turned out for the last 40 years. Do we have time for more? Mm -hmm. Absolutely not. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry about that. <laughs> I should have talked less. <laughs> Thank you, Sandy.